There has only been one conspiracy trial in the Kennedy assassination. It was brought by then New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. The real killer of uh, John Kennedy was a Central Intelligence Agency. And John Kennedy was not the, not the only uh, American leader uh, murdered by the CIA. He was just uh, the greatest. And he, this man has been described by the northern press uh, and even the southern press as, as a fraud and as a wide-eyed uh, uh, lunatic. He, he, didn't, he couldn't produce a thing that made any sense. He dealt with certain facts convenient to him while avoiding other facts that weren't convenient to him. Here he was, a local district attorney. What reason did he have to be investigating the president of the United States? Jim Garrison is surely a controversy unto himself, a controversy within a controversy. Uh, even many people who think that he was absolutely correct about the assassination and the conspiracy behind it uh, think that Garrison was a wild man and that he, uh, he did more harm than good. I can see the reasons for the complaints. I've uh, looked at them fairly closely because I've done a study of Garrison. I come out of it thinking that he's one of the really first-rate class act heroes of this whole ugly story which suffers so badly for heroes. As children, we become accustomed to hearing fairy tales. They're always pleasant stories and they're comforting to hear because good always triumphs over evil. At least, this is the way it is in fairy tales. However, in the real world, in which you and I must live, fairy tales are dangerous. They're dangerous because they're untrue. The conclusion of the Warren Report that President Kennedy was killed by a lone assassin is a fairy tale. I found Jim Garrison to be a very conservative man, really uh, someone rooted deeply in uh, American tradition. He had been in the FBI, and he was a prosecutor for 12 years. This was uh, not a flaming radical by any means. He was known as the Jolly Green Giant uh, down in uh, New Orleans. The people down there really uh, liked him immensely. They had seen how independent he had been in going after uh, rackets down there and uh, in taking the judges to task for not putting in enough time on the bench. Jim Garrison was a feisty district attorney in New Orleans. And uh, the very weekend of the assassination, as most good district attorneys, he had lots of tentacles out in the community and on the street. And he immediately began to get feedback that, uh, that Oswald had been there and that people had seen Oswald with various people, including David Ferry. And Oswald apparently had been in touch with David Ferry all the way back to the age of 15 when he had served in the Civil Air Patrol under David Ferry. David Ferry was a very strange individual. He uh, spoke five languages. He uh, suffered from a, a rare illness called alopecia, where he had no hair on uh, all over his body. David Ferry was a guy who would uh, glue his own wig on, and he put mohair above his eyes to uh, simulate eyebrows, and he more or less looked like a, a Halloween pumpkin. Dave, as you know, President Kennedy was assassinated on Friday. A man named Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested as a suspect and was then murdered yesterday by a man named Jack Ruby. We've heard reports that Oswald spent the summer here in New Orleans, and we've been advised that you knew Oswald pretty well. I never met anybody named Oswald. Anybody told you that has to be crazy. A very, a very mysterious character, was arrested two days after the assassination uh, on suspicions of having uh, participated in a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy, was interrogated at great length by the Secret Service and the FBI, and then was released. There was one event that, that struck him as being very funny. He investigated it very early on, turned the information over to a government agency, the FBI, feeling that there was enough there to investigate. They did not conclude the same thing, which caused his office a little bit of concern, like, gee, you know, we, we happen to think this is a very interesting thing. The FBI said, no, we don't believe that this is. And Jim let it lay. He let it lay for three years. It was about 1966 when, uh, you might say, I awoke from my dogmatic slumber because, like uh, so many American people, I, I found it 
impossible to believe that the United States government would lie to us about something like this. Two things triggered me in two steps. Uh, first was a, a conversation I had with Senator Russell Long talking about the assassination. And he mentioned to me that uh, there was no way in the world that that kid, meaning Lee Oswald, could have shot up that car, and meaning uh, Jack Kennedy, and Governor Connolly, the way that they say he did. That, and I said, are you telling me that you, that you, you think the, the Warren Commission lied, that that was all a lie? He said, absolutely, it had to be a lie. The possibility of a conspiracy uh, originating in New Orleans uh, should have been investigated, and it was investigated by FBI agents and perhaps by Secret Service agents. Whether they found everything that was to be found is entirely a different matter. So I, I said enough for the Warren Commission, volume, the whole 26 volumes, 26 volumes plus the report, started digging into it, and it was boring reading because one of the first things I discovered was most of the people they called had nothing to do with it. And uh, early on I sensed that this was a snow job to, to keep the facts from becoming clear. You, if you look at the Zapruder film, one of the first things you see is he was killed by a shot from the front. So one of the first things I did when I had was in the right position for it, I issued a subpoena for the uh, Zapruder film to Life magazine and they had to produce it. The last thing that came up for him was, that really started, startled him, was when he read that Lee Harvey Oswald had been given a Russian test uh, in, while in the Marines. I saw the a testimony of uh, Colonel Folsom of the Marines. He mentioned the test that Oswald had just taken in Russia. And somebody must have kicked him under the table because he quickly added, he didn't do too well. He got almost as many wrong as he got right. Well, of course, that was, to me, just like saying somebody saying, my dog is really stupid because when we play chess, I can, I can beat him three games out of five. He defected to the Soviet Union. He uh, came back to the United States where he was greeted with open arms. Nobody prosecuted him. Nobody said you rejected your citizenship. You renounced it before. You're not, you're not allowed back here. He could bring back a Russian woman. When Oswald returns to New Orleans in the summer of 63, he begins to pass out this communist uh, literature. On this literature was an address, and the address was 544 Camp Street. Saturday morning, by myself, I got up early and went down to 544 Camp Street, and the building looked familiar, and I realized as I went around the corner to look at the other entrance that this was the old office in 60, 1963 of Guy Bannister. Sure, Guy Bannister, ex-FBI man. Died a couple years ago. He used to recruit college students, infiltrate radical organizations on campus. Headed the anti-communist League of the Caribbean. All out of this office. It was an old antiquated building um, on the corner of Lafayette and Camp, right near Lafayette Square. And um, Bannister had his office there. I had been in it on occasion. and. Uh, I went in there one time with Lee to view some um, arms that they had brought from an old blimp base. David Ferry and Lee and Jack Ruby. Why Oswald was associated with that particular address remains uh, one of the critical pieces of evidence in this whole investigation. And it indicates very strongly that all his passing out leaflets and literature favorable to Fidel Castro on the streets of New Orleans that summer actually was posturing to set up some type of an intelligence scenario. Guy Bannister's office served as headquarters for something that we later found out it was called Operation Mongoose. We found that David Ferry was one of the main people who was uh, around there all the time and that Bannister was running a training camp north of Lake Pontchartrain, very close to New Orleans, uh, for Cuban exiles right-wing mercenaries. Uh, they were training for a what they hoped would be another invasion of Cuba. And they had amassed huge stockpiles of weapons and ammunition that were constantly being brought in and out of Guy Bannister's office, right in the center of the uh, intelligence community. This had to be noticed by the FBI and the CIA offices that were right in proximity. While conducting his investigation, Jim ran across in the Warren Commission volumes uh, an interview with Dean Andrews. 
Jim happened to know him because they attended law school together at Tulane. On Saturday, the day after the assassination of President Kennedy, Andrews had received a strange phone call from a man named Clay Bertrand asking him, Andrews, to go to Dallas to represent Lee Harvey Oswald as his attorney. Well, Clay Bertrand, whoever the real man would be, might be, is one of the participants in the assassination. And a man named Dean Andrews is protecting him by not giving his real name. I decided I wanted his real name. So I set up a meeting at lunch. Well, I don't know what he's up to. He's picking me like chicken, shucking me like corn, stewing me like an oyster. I mean, he ain't putting nothing down but air. Dean, are you trying to tell me that you received a call from uh, uh, Clay Bertrand, who's a client of, who was a client of yours, but you don't know what he looks like because you've never seen him, and he'd say, scouts on him, my man. He's got the right ta-ta, but the wrong ho-ho. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call you into the grand jury, and I spoke some of his language, so to speak. Uh, I said, now, when you dance into the grand jury, you better lay the truth on them, <laughs> or else you are going to be indicted and go to trial for perjury. We tried him, and the jury found him guilty. So Jim wanted to find out who this Clay Bertrand was. Since he got nowhere with uh, uh, Dean Andrews, he decided to look into wh the French Quarter where most of uh, Dean Andrews' clientele came from. So we started eating those bars every night and asking bartenders uh, who Clay Bertrand, Bertrand was. Well, first we were bumping against a stone wall, but one of our assistants had grown up in the Sixth Ward. One of his relatives happened to know this bartender and, and called and said, uh, why don't you just tell him the truth? And so we went back and asked the man again, and he was perfectly candid. He said, sure. He said, I don't know why they're not telling you, but uh, everybody down here in the quarter knows who Clay Bertrand is. That's, that's Mr. Shaw, Clay Shaw. This came as a great shock because Clay Shaw was one of the most upstanding and respected uh, members of the uh, community in New Orleans. He was a pillar of society. He had done a lot to restore the city, and he had been the founder of the international trademark. He could become the ambassador to the court of St. James tomorrow and English wouldn't blink an eye because he would fit into the world of diplomacy so beautifully, and yet he never graduated from college. Shaw denied knowing uh, Oswald, denied knowing Ferry, uh, denied knowing any of the people who identified him uh, as Clay Bertrand. I am not Clay Bertrand. But Jim kept looking, and what they came across was a rumor that uh, Shaw, Ferry, and Oswald had been spotted together in a little town called Clinton. Garrison uh, located witnesses in uh, Clinton, Louisiana, who would testify that in 1963, uh, during the drive to get blacks to register to vote, that Lee Harvey Oswald showed up at the voters' registration site, and he was accompanied by Clay Shaw and David Ferry. Now, what would a guy like Clay Shaw be doing with someone like David Ferry? Okay, what would a guy like Clay Shaw be doing with somebody like Lee Harvey Oswald? Okay, but witness after witness testified about this Clinton trip. With Clay Shaw, another part of the evidence that Garrison had acquired uh, was a party that was attended supposedly by Clay Shaw by Lee Harvey Oswald and David Ferry at Ferry's apartment and the witness in